Hey, I'm Rico Brouwer. We're going to talk about the search engine manipulation effect. So how Google manipulates what you get to see when you ask it something with Dr. Robert Epstein. Welcome in Café Weltschmerz. Uh, I'm Rico Brouwer and my guest is Dr. Robert Epstein from, where are you currently? Uh, San Diego, California. All right. So you're talking to Europe, to the Netherlands. And um, over here, uh, our Minister of the Interior just released a report to, um, to a parliament detailing how search engines may or may not uh, be tampered with or the, the, the answers that they provide. Well, that is something that you went into detail with uh, researching. So I uh, invited you here. Great that you're here. Now, nice to be here. Yeah. Um, in August this year, just to start this thing, uh, you ended up in a Twitter crossfire between Donald Trump and, uh, and Hillary Clinton about the research you did and uh, about your testimony before US Congress about that. So we'll get into that in, in detail. But to start off, what did you research? Well, I've been doing uh, two kinds of, of research uh, now for almost seven years. Uh, one is I've been uh, discovering and studying and quantifying uh, new methods of influence on the Internet. Uh, so a company like Google, for example, uh, can change people's thinking and opinions and votes and purchases. Um, without people knowing and without leaving a paper trail, and I've done uh, dozens of controlled, randomized experiments uh, in countries around the world, uh, covering uh, five national elections uh, to understand these new methods of influence. Uh, the first I discovered I call SEEM, S-E-M-E, which stands for Search Engine Manipulation Effect. That's about the power that search results biased search results have to shift uh, opinions and thinking and votes and uh, the power is enormous it's unbelievable really it's incredible and the second kind of research i've done uh, has involved setting up uh, systems to monitor uh, what companies like google are actually showing people in other words it's one thing to show in experiments that uh, a company like google has the power to change opinions and votes. Uh, but you know, the question is, are they actually using that power? Is there bias in their search results? So I've set up monitoring systems in 2016 to monitor the 2016 uh, presidential election in the United States, and in 2018 to monitor our midterm elections in the United States, uh, to look over people's shoulders and see uh, what Google and other search engines, Bing and Yahoo, we're actually showing people to see whether there was bias uh, in search results on those three search engines. All right. Well, don't, don't make it a cliffhanger. So what did you find between, between <laughs> those three uh, search engines? Uh, well, in both uh, 2016 and 2018, I found a very substantial uh, pro-liberal uh, bias. <coughs> Excuse me. In both 2016 and 2018, I found a substantial pro-liberal bias uh, on the Google search engine, and that's in all 10 search positions on the first page of search results, which is where most clicks go, but not on Bing or Yahoo. So this was definitely a Google phenomenon. In 2016, the bias was large enough to have shifted to Hillary Clinton, whom I supported, uh, between 2.6 and 10.4 million votes with no one knowing that this had occurred and without leaving a paper trail. In 2018, the level of bias that I found uh, could have shifted as many as 78.2 million votes to Democrats, again with no one knowing. Now that was a midterm election, so 
uh, those votes would have been spread across uh, many elections nationwide. The point is there's a lot of power here uh, to change opinions, to shift votes. Uh, and as far as we could tell, uh, that power was being exercised in the sense that we did find a substantial bias in search results on Google, but not the other search engines. So did you research other social media platforms or search engines as well? Did you look into Twitter or Facebook, for instance? In 2020, we're hoping to expand uh, our monitoring capabilities so we can look at Twitter and Facebook and other companies as well and we can look at uh, bias in news feeds, uh, we can look at uh, shadow banning, we can look at email suppression, uh, and many other uh, kinds of manipulations. Uh, for example, on YouTube, which is part of Google, uh, it is now the case that 70%, let me repeat that, 70% of the videos that people watch on YouTube are actually suggested by Google's ultra-secret up-next algorithm. Uh, so Google uh, knows who is undecided uh, in an election, and what this tells you is that Google's algorithm can easily suggest videos to people that will shift their opinions. People who are undecided are very vulnerable to this kind of manipulation. That's one of many things that we hope to monitor in 2020. Okay, let's let's take one step back. So just to get the, the, the image very clear on this on this table here in Cafe Weltschmerz. Let's move back to 2015 when you did the re or you published the research into the search engine manipulation effect. The way I understand it is that you researched how a voter that's undecided maybe influenced and how that actually the, the stuff that he gets to see through his search engine will will actually change his opinion, right? Uh, that is correct. And this uh, effect uh, turned out to be one of the largest ever discovered in the behavioral sciences. Uh, we published uh, the, our first five experiments in uh, the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in the United States. Uh, and that study involved more than 4,000 people uh, in, in two countries, the United States and India. Uh, and in India, in 2014, we actually uh, used real voters who were being uh, strongly influenced uh, by the campaign there uh, for the 2014 national election in India. And even with real voters in the middle of a real election, we found that when there is bias, a statistical bias in search results uh, that easily shifts 20% or more of undecided voters because they trust those high-ranking search results. Uh, and it can shift up to 80% of undecided voters in some demographic groups. So this is an extremely powerful effect. Um, probably the numbers that we have are too low because uh, we're only uh, you know, looking at uh, at one search that someone conducts as part of our experiment. But in reality, a company like Google can be showing people biased search results day after day after day after day, multiple times a day. And we know from our experiments that when you show people biased search results more than once, uh, the numbers go up. In other words, opinions change even more, voting preferences change even more. Yeah. So I think we're underestimating the power of, of these type of effects. Repetition pays off, that's what you're saying. And then Repetition pays off. I should point out also that SEAM is the first of, on, of, of about a dozen effects now that we have discovered. We're currently in the process of understanding and quantifying seven of these. But as I say, SEAM was only the first one this is a much bigger problem. Uh, it's not just bias in search results, uh, you know, that can be used to, to shift people's opinions and votes. There are many, many other techniques, it turns out, that people cannot see, they're not aware of. This is all subliminal influence. It's extremely dangerous. Yeah, maybe for non-native English speakers, how would you describe subliminal? What, what is that? Well, subliminal means that, that you can't see it. It's below the level of your uh, perception. 
So for example, even if my staff shows me a list of uh, search results that we're going to use in an experiment, uh, I, being an expert on this, I looking at a list of search results, I can't see bias. Almost no one can see bias in a list of search results. You'd have to click through to every web page and see whether that web page you know, favored one cause or another, favored one candidate or another. It's, it's very, very hard for anyone to see bias. Now, some of our studies are so large that we have had a few people in those big studies who claim that they did see bias. Um, in the big study in India, which involved more than 2,000 people throughout India, 99.5% uh, of the participants in our study uh, did not see bias. But that leaves a few people who do see the bias, and so this is really frightening. Uh, the very few people who do see the bias in search results, they shift even farther in the direction of the bias. Oh. <laughs> and, in other words, merely being able to see the bias doesn't protect you from it. No. It's as if when you see the bias, you say, aha, the search engine actually prefers one candidate. It must be a very good candidate. So Google is an American company. Uh, but it's used here also. I mean, most people in the Netherlands or maybe the European Union will use Google as their search engine. Now, when you mention India, I'm, I'm not aware if Google is there, a big search engine there, I'm assuming it is. But if you find bias in India, are you claiming that Google has a preference in India or how does that work? Well, you know, without a whistleblower, or some leaked documents, uh, generally we can't know what the source is of the bias. We can't know, you know why we're seeing the bias. But I will tell you in India, more than 90% of search is done on Google. Okay. Uh, my wife and I lived in the Fiji Islands a few years ago where I had a professorship there at the University of the South Pacific and more than 90% of search in the Fiji Islands is done on Google. In fact, 92% of search uh, around the world is now done on Google uh, everywhere outside of China, uh, which uh, at the moment uh, is not working with Google, and North Korea, where almost no one has internet access. So uh, Google is a monopoly around the world when it comes to search. You went to testify before Congress about your findings. You were invited to United States Congress? Yes, I was, and uh, uh, it was... Uh, was a, it was an exciting experience, but also very frustrating because uh, the expert that Google sent to that hearing, uh, under oath, swore, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, he made a number of statements under oath which were false. I knew they were false. Uh, for example, he was asked whether Google has any blacklists, and under oath he said no. Uh, you know, I've written about Google's blacklists. I wrote a big article about them in 2016. And about a month after that hearing this year, which was in July, that's 2019, uh, a whistleblower from Google brought with him more than 950 pages of documents and a video. And among those documents were two of Google's blacklists, actually called blacklists within the company. So Google has dozens of blacklists and Google's representatives, including its CEO, uh, have lied under oath when testifying before Congress. Now, when James Clapper lies to Congress, there's no follow-up. How, how does it work when Google CEO lies then? Well, that's a very uh, interesting question. It, it turns out that uh, Congress has the authority to punish people when they lie before Congress, but they haven't actually uh, arrested anyone since 1935. Uh, so Congress uh, does not exercise its authority uh, to punish people when they lie. So unfortunately, uh, people uh, these days lie rather freely when they're testifying before Congress. It's quite frustrating. So what was his opinion about your testimony then? Did he call you out or? Well, uh, you know, the, the opinions of the people at the hearing unfortunately varied by political party. So this is a problem we have right now in the United States, is extreme partisanship. So, you know, whatever uh, people say publicly has to do with their party. And, and unfortunately, people uh, are not thinking clearly about a number of issues. Uh, generally speaking, right now in the United States, Republicans 
uh, are speaking out against Google and other big tech companies uh, and because Google and other big tech companies are supporting Democrats. So Democrats, when they speak up at all, they defend the tech companies because they get a lot of money, a lot of donations from the tech companies. And they also, it turns out, get a lot of votes, millions of votes because of the support of the tech companies. All right. So um, you said there's a few uh, separate issues with um, how Google behaves as a search engine and Facebook to societies worldwide. So one was the aggressive surveillance, like recording everything about us. Uh, suppression of content, we talked about that also, blacklists. And the subtle manipulation of the thinking and behavior of more than 2.5 billion people. That's your statement. I'm assuming you mean the global population with an internet connection, right? People using Google. That is correct. All right. And so, that number, by the way, will exceed 4 billion that will exceed four billion within the next three years. Okay, so let's if we, if we drill down into that subtle manipulation of the thinking and behavior of more than four billion people. You're talking to a very small group of that, the Netherlands, like 17 million. Um, our Dutch parliament last year um, asked for research to be done into manipulation by social media and by search engines and to figure out also if there's foreign involvement there. Now, our Minister of the Interior took that job, asked for a report to be made, and that was just published. I ask you to look into that report and assess it. So, in your expert opinion, what was your opinion about this report? Well, chapter three in that report was about a, a study that was conducted by people in the Netherlands uh, about search engines. And uh, unfortunately, the, uh, that report somehow was interpreted by people as if it concluded that there was no manipulation uh, in the Netherlands by search engines. But that's not what chapter three actually says in the report. Uh, it actually says that there was evidence uh, that there was uh, uh, a bias in Google search results uh, sufficient perhaps to shift opinions and votes in the Netherlands and it breaks it down by uh, you know different types of search terms uh, so the point is it does actually say uh, that this kind of manipulation is apparently occurring uh, in the Netherlands now that study it turns out was deeply flawed because uh, it used an anonymous search engine and it only used it one search engine on one computer so that does not tell you what real people are getting uh, and so that study was very deeply flawed uh, because uh, it's it's getting results that are not typical of what everyone gets we get results that are uh, customized personalized for us uh, google knows which of us are undecided it knows which of us can be influenced and uh, if you want to really uh, see the full extent of bias uh, that's occurring, you have to look over the shoulders of real people as we do in my monitoring projects. And that's the only way you can really find out. So, uh, you know, that study that was done uh, in the Netherlands, it did show uh, the power of search engines uh, to shift opinions and votes. It actually did show that, but it was not properly done. And, and I don't think it showed the full extent of the power uh, that a company like Google has uh, to influence opinions and votes uh, in the Netherlands. Yeah, and also those, those um, researchers in their conclusion said, well, we didn't find any, basically. Or to put it more, more literally, we didn't find any um, foreign organizations manipulating our elections. So they beat around the bush a little bit. Now, just to make sure that I understand you correctly, when I right click my browser and I go give me a private session, that's when Google doesn't know who I am and, and has forgotten about my the way I voted previously or the, the stuff that I'm worried about or if I'm an undecided voter. Whereas I just start my browser, it'll know my history, right? And, and the point that you're making is, well, yeah, you get your personalized search results if Google knows who you are and that's the way most people browse. Now, 
there's two things that Google gives me. One is I type in, I don't know, Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump. And even before I finish typing, I get a list of optional questions, right? The, the suggested questions. Did you find bias in those as well? Well, uh, we in 2016 did not know uh, much about that yet. And uh, we didn't know how to monitor search suggestions, uh, which are those search terms that Google suggests to you when you start to type a search term. Um, beginning in 2016, however, uh, we did begin to study those search suggestions and uh, we found two things. Number one, uh, it appears that Google is manipulating uh, you uh, from the very first character you start to type in the search box. So in the United States, for example, if you type the letter A, it's very likely uh, that you will be suggested the search terms Amazon or Amazon Prime in the first, second, or third position of the suggestions that they show you, maybe in all three positions. Uh, this is because Amazon is Google's largest advertiser. It's also the case that Google is Amazon's a single largest source of traffic. Uh, so these are business partners and Google wants you to go to uh, Amazon. The second thing we uh, discovered uh, is that just by manipulating search suggestions, we could manipulate people's opinions and votes. In fact, we could turn, in experiments, we could turn a 50-50 split among undecided voters into a 90-10 split with no one knowing that they've been manipulated. Uh, this is just by manipulating search suggestions. Uh, Google certainly uh, knows this. Uh, in one of the leaks last year out of Google to the Wall Street Journal, uh, one uh, person at Google is saying to others there in an email, how can we use ephemeral experiences to change people's views about Trump's travel ban? Ephemeral experiences, that's a, it's a wonderful phrase. Ephemeral means uh, short-lived. Ephemeral means they show you something like a search suggestion or a search result, uh, and it appears before your eyes, it influences you, it disappears, yeah. and it's gone forever. It's not recorded anywhere. You can't go back in time and find it again. So people at Google are well aware that they can use ephemeral experiences like search suggestions, uh, like search results to influence people's opinions. Uh, this is exactly what I've been studying now for almost seven years, and people at Google are very much aware that they have this power. Well, I can imagine, I mean, underneath it all, it also is a big advertisement company. That's how they make their money. So I can imagine if, if Amazon is a big customer making uh, lots of revenue for them, then that would be uh, appearing with the letter A. Um, but would that be a service that they're offering or how does that work? Can I buy that kind of advertisement? Well, you can buy all kinds of things from Google, but if Google itself wants to do something, it wants to support one candidate or one company or one cause, there's nothing you can do. So, for example, if you type into that search bar the letter G, well, then you're going to find a long list of Google products. Now, no one has control over that. No one can counteract that. No one can stop Google from doing that. So that's the problem. Um, you know, everyone is trying to get their content uh, onto Facebook, onto Google, onto Twitter, everyone's trying. Millions of people, millions of companies, and so on. They're all trying to get their content out there. And that's a competitive process. There's nothing wrong with that. But what I'm saying is that if the platform itself uh, wants to advance one particular perspective or wants to uh, help one particular political candidate, there's nothing you can do. There is no way to counteract that at all. Well, well, we'll get to that at the end of the conversation because end of the day, there's always, always laws that we can invent. But, but let's leave that for, to, to the end of the conversation because um, before Congress, you, didn't, you said, I, I don't claim Google deliberately manipulated the 2016 elections. So if it's not deliberately, how is it then? By accident? Well, you know, this is a very important point. I'm so glad that you asked this question because I, I, I used to worry that Google was doing things deliberately. And then eventually I realized 
that that was not a very important issue at all. Uh, because even if their algorithms, you know, with no one paying attention there, even if their algorithms uh, are, uh, you know, showing bias toward one candidate or another, well, that has a big influence on elections. That can shift millions of votes, even if no one at the company is paying attention. Uh, remember, Google is in every country in the world outside of China and North Korea. So they're probably not paying attention to what's happening in every country, but their algorithm always ends up favoring, you know, one uh, dog food over another, one cereal over another, one beer over another. Always, it's built to do that. It's built to put one thing ahead of another, and it's always putting one candidate, one political candidate, ahead of another. Always. And when it does so, it is shifting thinking and it is shifting votes, um, even if no one is paying attention. So in other words, you know, think how big this problem is. Think how big this problem is. It's possible that thinking and behavior around the world are actually being determined by a computer program, perhaps with no one paying attention. And we know the computer programs always reflect the biases of the people who did the programming. This has been shown in other people's research, not my own. But oh. that's an oh. for myself. When I write a computer program, it reflects my biases. There's no way to stop that. Yeah, okay, so your professional opinion, is it just that or is something more at, 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 happening here? Well, there's different possibilities. It's a, there's the possibility of, a, of an executive at Google saying, you know, we're going to support uh, Hillary Clinton or we're going to make sure that uh, Donald Trump does not uh, become president for a second term. In fact, uh, we have on record now executives uh, at Google saying exactly that. We know for sure that executives have made those decisions uh, at Google. Uh, so, you know, it can be an executive. It could be a rogue employee, one single employee who decides to uh, to impact uh, the upcoming election in Cameroon, in Africa. Uh, you know, it could be one employee, maybe someone who came from a country in Africa and has taken an interest. One employee has the power to change search results or search suggestions or answer boxes. Uh, and and there's there's actually uh, um, documented evidence that this has occurred at Google. The entire uh, Street View scandal, uh, which uh, was discovered by a professor like myself a, a few years ago, uh, was blamed by Google on one single employee, Marius Milner, uh, at Google. Um, in that in that scandal, we learned that for more than 40 years and more than more excuse me more than four years, in more than 30 countries, uh, Google Street View vehicles were driving around our streets, not only taking pictures of our homes and our businesses, but also they were uh, they were uh, recording uh, Wi-Fi data. A massive amounts of Wi-Fi data, terabytes of Wi-Fi data, with no one's permission at all. And uh, this entire project was blamed on one programmer, one programmer at Google. Did they fire him? Not at all. He is still working at the company. Marius Milner is his name, and he's a hero at Google. So one programmer can affect an election or people's opinions on any subject. And the third possibility, which I just mentioned before, is that it's possible in some cases that, you know, the algorithm is just put out there. The algorithm inherently contains biases. The algorithm inherently always puts one thing ahead of another. Maybe no one's paying attention, but the algorithm itself will change people's opinions and it will change the outcomes of close elections. Uh, I calculated that as of 2015, uh, upwards of 25% of the national elections in the world uh, were actually being determined by Google's search algorithm. All right, now just to wrap up that bit about intent, there was this recent Google whistleblower, and I don't know if, if you were referring to him, Zach Voorhees, and he came out claiming that indeed Google was deliberately trying to change the outcome of elections. So there are people, former employees at Google that, that are making that blunt statement. 
All right. Yes, Google employees now, uh, current employees and former employees are speaking out. Uh, and uh, Mr. Voorhees is not only speaking out, he brought with him more than 950 pages of documents and a video. And the documents and the video, they confirm what Mr. Voorhees is saying, uh, that there is very strong political bias uh, at the company. I happen to sympathize with that bias. Uh, but still, this is extremely dangerous that a company that has the power to influence the thinking and opinions and votes yeah. of billions of people around the world, uh, that they have strong bias and that that bias is actually uh, actually expressed uh, in what they're showing us. And of course, I saw that myself in my 2016 and 2018 monitoring projects. I measured that bias. I measured the political bias uh, in in two major elections, two national elections in the United States. Yeah, on the other hand, as a researcher, this is a great investigation. So you, you must be looking forward to the 2020 elections then, or no? Well, I'm not looking forward to it, no, because, yeah. um, because uh, after I testified before Congress, uh, as you mentioned earlier, uh, President uh, Trump uh, tweeted about uh, my testimony and the next thing that happened was that Hillary Clinton, whom I have supported for 20 years, Hillary Clinton uh, then tweeted that my work had been debunked, which is false, and that it was based on uh, data from 21 undecided voters, which is false. Uh, and unfortunately, that message got picked up uh, by uh, media uh, sources around the world. Uh, literally hundreds of articles, including one that just appeared yesterday. So uh, in my reputation has been greatly damaged uh, by this. And I know I don't look forward to 2020 because I believe that I will be attacked uh, probably every single day uh, by, uh, by Democrats whom I generally support. I'll be attacked by, uh, by Google and other companies that we're monitoring. Uh, so I'll be under constant attack. And uh, no, I don't think that's good for me. I don't think that's good for my family. It's certainly not good for my reputation. So the European Union appears to be waking up to issues. Um, you mentioned they issued over 5 billion euros in fines since 2017. Do you no, think- No, it's actually, it's up to 10 billion now. All right, okay. Yeah, well, same question. Does that make an impression? Does that help at all, finding them financially? No, it doesn't make any difference at all. And in, uh, in fact, in the United States, uh, we just fined um, Facebook $5 billion uh, for failing to protect user data. Uh, and uh, Facebook had actually put that money aside months before the government made that decision. It has no effect at all. Uh, the big fines against Google in Europe, now over 10, 10 billion euros in total, four big fines since 2017, I make no difference at all to a company like that. That that company uh, is now bringing in more than a hundred thirty billion dollars a year in uh, in uh, in revenue, and has more than a hundred billion dollars uh, in cash in the bank. The fines don't affect the, the companies at all. And in fact, even in the past few days, Google has made very aggressive moves to increase its uh, surveillance and manipulation capabilities. Uh, you know, nothing that, that any government has done has, has stopped these, uh, these large monopolies at all from doing what they do. Yes, that's true. So, but in your congressional testimony, you also said how Congress can immediately end Google's monopoly on search. Um, would you elaborate on that? So what would be the solution? Yes, it turns out there is a solution uh, to the Google problem. What is the Google problem? The Google problem, of course, is that it has a that it has a worldwide monopoly uh, on search. That is the Google problem. I feel free to kill so, that thing. It's okay. You need to turn something off or no? Yes, I'm trying. Take your time. The okay. The Google problem is that it has a worldwide monopoly on search. Yeah. Uh, and when I testified before Congress. I said, in fact, there is a solution to that problem. And in fact, there is a solution to that problem. Not all of the problems that tech companies present to the world can easily be solved, 
but Google's worldwide monopoly on search can easily be ended by the United States Congress, uh, by uh, federal agencies in the United States, or by the European Union. It turns out the European Union could quickly and permanently end Google's worldwide uh, monopoly on search. How would they do that? They would simply declare that uh, Google's index, which is the database that they use uh, to, uh, to generate search results, that that index um, must be a public commons. And that's an old concept. The idea of the public commons is an old concept. It's a very old European concept uh, that goes back hundreds of years. Uh, and in fact, there is precedent in law in Europe and the United States for declaring a resource of public commons. In this case, Google's index uh, is, could easily be declared a public commons uh, because they don't even own the content of what's in their database. They literally stole it, or the, the technical term is scraped. They scraped it from people's websites around the world. There's nothing in their index that they own. It's all a material that belongs to the world. If their index is made into a public commons, and that means uh, that other companies, small and large, and perhaps even you know students in school, could set up their own search platforms drawing on Google's index. And Google's index is the best and most comprehensive in the world. That's why their search results are so good. But what happened within a period of, mo of months or just within a year or two, thousands of competing search platforms would emerge. They would all give good search results because they're drawing on Google's index. Uh, and they would use their own models for you know, how to build their platform. So you'd finally have tremendous innovation in the area of search. There has been no innovation in the area of search for 20 years because Google has monopolized a search around the world. But if this plan is adopted, then there would be rapid innovation in search. In Europe, based in France, there is a search company called Quant. Q-W-A-N-T, quant.com, which actually uh, is, an, is an innovative search engine. Now, it's quite small. You know, that's the problem. It's quite small, and not many people outside of France use it, although it is the official search engine now of the French government. Uh, and they do search quite differently than Google does. But Quant is an example of, you know, a small company trying to be innovative. Uh, if Google's index is made into a public commons, then you would have thousands of companies like Quant uh, with different uh, types of different ways of doing search and different uh, business models. There's another company in Europe called StartPage. Start is the opposite of stop. StartPage.com, which is based in the Netherlands. And uh, since 2009, StartPage has had access to Google's index. So there's precedent for what for my the plan I'm proposing because StartPage has had full access to Google's index to, since 2009. It gives excellent search results, of course, because it's drawing from Google and it doesn't track anybody. It preserves your privacy. So StartPage is an example of the kind of search platform that could emerge, uh, you know, around the world, thousands of them. Uh, each vying for our attention, each catering to different audiences like uh, like women or people in the Netherlands. Uh, and this would be very good for search. Uh, it would be tremendous. It would make search competitive again as search was uh, in the beginning. And Google would lose its power. Uh, most of its ability to surveil, to censor, and to manipulate uh, mm -hmm. would disappear because uh, you, they would have um, you know very few users. Uh, because there'd be so many competing uh, search platforms. Well, yeah, but another way to break up their scale, the, the fact that they're big and have a monopoly would be to cut them in half. But you mentioned, well, that would be that would be a shame. I mean, it's a big index. Let's put it to good use for, for the global society. So breaking up might not be the solution. Uh, we need to regulate. Well, you, you, right? The point is you, you, you can't really, uh, you can break up Google by taking away YouTube, which it owns, uh, you know, you could you could take yeah. away some of the companies that it's purchased, but you can't break up the Google search engine. Mm -hmm. That's exactly. impossible okay. because then it would be it wouldn't work properly and it wouldn't give good search results. So their power lies with the search engine itself, yeah. and the solution to that problem is to make their index public.
All right, so there might be laws coming somewhere down that road, but I don't know how American lawmaking goes. In the European Union, we're not that fast. What can people do in the meantime that will be using other search engines then? Well, I have not received a targeted ad myself on my phone or on my computer since 2014. So uh, clearly there, there must be a way to use the internet that's different than what most people do. And sure enough, uh, there are there are ways to use the internet so that you do have some privacy and you don't give up a lot of information to these surveillance companies. Google is a surveillance company. Facebook is a surveillance company. They pretend to be something else, but in fact, they're not. 98% of Facebook's revenue comes from advertising and uh, they get the data that they they need uh, you know, for, for advertisements um, from the information that we provide. So you know, Facebook, all of its platforms, uh, its WhatsApp uh, platform, its Instagram platform, its basic social media platform, these are surveillance tools. Uh, Google is actually surveilling uh, the world's population over more than 200 different platforms. Uh, most of the time, people are unaware that Google is even conducting uh, this uh, surveillance. For example, Google a few years ago bought uh, the Nest company, which makes uh, smart home thermostats. But after Google bought that company, they put uh, microphones into the home thermostats. And now and uh, they've added cameras to the home thermostats. So these are the thermostats have now become surveillance devices. Uh, Google just purchased the company Fitbit, which provides uh, trackers that people wear on their wrist and this will give Google 24-hour-a-day uh, ac a access to physiological data, to sleep data, exercise data, activity data. Uh, so Google is a surveillance company. So what you can do is start to uh, make yourself, uh, you know, to, uh, to, to shield yourself from surveillance. And that means, for example, not using Gmail, which is a surveillance tool, not using Chrome, which is um, Google's uh, browser, that's a surveillance tool, not using Android devices. Android is owned by Google, that's another surveillance tool. Uh, and I've summarized the steps that people can take at uh, the URL uh, my7simplesteps.com, my7simplesteps.com. And, uh, you know, people can learn how to protect themselves, how to protect their children, uh, you know, how to protect their loved ones from online surveillance. In my opinion, uh, online surveillance should be illegal. In my opinion, the entire surveillance business model, which Google invented and which is now being used by thousands of companies, in my opinion, that is not a legitimate business model. It's deceptive. It should be made illegal. And I'm not the only one saying that. Uh, Tim Cook, the head of Apple Computers, uh, has, has said that publicly, that that is not a legitimate business model. It's highly deceptive by its very nature. So I saw your testimony before Congress and it was shorter, but in no uncertain terms. What was the follow up to that by Congress done by our lawmakers? Well, I was invited a few weeks after that by Senator Ted Cruz to have a private dinner with him in Washington. It, the dinner was almost four hours long. Uh, we talked uh, nonstop and we did not talk politics. We just talked about the tech companies. He's extremely interested in trying to figure out uh, how to how to uh, curtail the power of these companies because these companies present a serious threat to the democratic system of government because they can shift so many votes uh, with no one knowing that they're doing so. And they present a serious threat to human autonomy because they can change people's thinking and opinions, attitudes, beliefs, again, with no one knowing. So S Senator Cruz is certainly very interested uh, I have spoken to people at the, at the White House, to other members of Congress. Um, the problem is our government is so dysfunctional at the moment, probably more dysfunctional now than it has ever been. And so, uh, you know, uh, how any laws can be passed regarding this issue is, is very unclear, especially because the tech companies, uh, more than 96 percent of their donations go to Democrats. Uh, so, you know, they donate a lot of money to Democrats and of course they also shift votes to Democrats, whether deliberately or not, it doesn't matter. And uh, Democrats are unlikely to cooperate uh, in any effort uh, to curtail the power of these companies. Now, the companies, on the other hand, could also 
uh, be uh, be limited in various ways by uh, other federal agents, agencies that we have, such as the Federal Trade Commission or the Department of Justice. And just recently, uh, literally, uh, the attorneys general uh, from 48 United States states and two territories, so that's 50 attorneys general, have started an antitrust investigation against Google. Uh, that's uh, unprecedented. I, I've never seen, uh, you know, such unanimity among so many uh, states. Uh, and the attorney general of a state in the United States is quite powerful. They can file lawsuits. Uh, you know, they can uh, right. uh, take companies to court. So that's now underway. Uh, there's and the, and the United States Congress has actually launched investigations uh, against Google and Facebook. So. Uh, you know, we'll we'll see. Now, we also know that in Europe, um, that the European Commission has been very aggressive uh, in investigating Google, and they're starting to investigate Facebook as well. So, uh, I think if there are any big changes come, they're probably going to come from the European Union. Uh, that's my guess. And uh, in the meantime, my own personal uh, solution to trying to limit the power of these tech companies. Uh, is to set up monitoring systems. So I am hoping to set up a very large, very comprehensive system uh, to monitor what these companies are showing people and saying to people um, in the months leading up to our 2020 presidential election. I calculate that these companies can shift, if they're all supporting the same presidential candidate, these companies can shift 15 million votes to one candidate uh, without anyone knowing they've done so and without leaving, leaving a paper trail. If we don't have a monitoring system in place, we will never know that this has occurred. 50 million for America, that is uh, like 10%, right? More or less. That's about 10%, that's correct, of the number of people who are expected to vote in the election. Yeah. Okay. Dr. Robert Epstein, thank you so much for sharing this with uh, the Netherlands and the rest of the world. Everybody can still click on that YouTube click, uh, clip even if it's downlisted, maybe. Let's see how that works. Thank you. Thank you for speaking with me.